Hello, I'm Hilary. This is session six of the New Testament Crumb blog. Don't faint, but we are actually going to start the New Testament today. First though, we've got a last look at a little cultural subject. We are tackling religion. Well, not all of it, but just a taste of what's going on with the Jews at the time of Jesus. Our guide, Palestine in the Time of Jesus by Hansen and Oakman, remind us that the fusions of social systems, religion and politics were a very different setup to our Western institutional structure. So for instance, Herod's motive for spending a great deal of money on rebuilding the Jewish temple was not a holy motive. Jesus called the temple a cave of bandits and no longer a house of prayer. It had become something representing a warped system, a once beautiful covenant with God. But questions that we might consider at this stage is what was the temple like at the time of Jesus and how did it operate? Who controlled it and who benefited from it? For people today, the Christian religion is mainly an individual and spiritual choice. We attend or lead the church of our choosing. For ancient kinship orientated Jews, required religious activity occurred in two places routinely, in the home or in elite controlled temples where people strive to occupy the key positions of benefit from the religious system. Theology was for the few who would have been literate elites and it was often used to justify a group's or an institution's position of power. Sometimes it would be used to expose or criticise opposition to that institution like Jesus of Nazareth. Of course this is something that we continue to do today. So we are discovering that this Judean temple in Jerusalem was a political institution in lots of ways. So it consisted of an outer court of the Gentiles, so-called because Gentiles were permitted there, which of course now makes sense in terms of the patron-client setup. The temple area inside was divided into three basic courts, ones open to men and women, and one open only to Judean men, and then one open only to the priests. And the priest's area is divided again into those three areas, the place of sacrifices outside the temple building, which was continually in use with the annual requirement of probably tens or hundreds of thousands of animals. And then you've got the holy place within the temple building and the holy of holies. The high priest was set over a system and he was controlled by the Roman prefect. Now this isn't the Temple of Solomon or even the rebuilt temple after the return of the exiles. This is a temple built for them by someone who controlled them, an outsider. As well as the temple, you've got synagogues in various cities and towns. Most likely these were also public gathering spaces for prayer services and festival services and perhaps other community activities. And we have our two well-known influential leadership groups, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And we need to keep in mind that they are actually relatively small, but they are powerful factions. And they're mainly disinterested in the lives of everyday people. Hansen and Oakman conclude that the role of the temple in the life of early Roman Palestine was so persuasive, pervasive, was so pervasive that it would be thought of as an institution intruding into and organising the social life of every Judean region and settlement. And one of the questions posed in this book is what stands out for you as the largest cultural gap between your own experience and those of a person from first century Palestine? And what steps are necessary to bridge the gap? And that's the thing I've learned most during our preparation sessions is that we need to keep asking that question. What steps do I need to take for this or that passage? What questions do I need to ask? You know, injecting our own narrative to fill the backstory or try and explain a jarring verse, it needs to be a stop sign, a reverse park, reconsider the approach. Sometimes 
God will bring a Bible story intentionally into our own narrative, our life, something that's happening, seemingly lifting the words out of their cultural context to bring us something into our context. And we shouldn't have an issue with this. We don't need to limit the ways that God can speak to us. But it's a different case when we lift the, the verse out of its context in order to fit it into our human understanding. I want to get the Bible the right way around. <laughs> So over these past five and a half sessions, we have considered the story so far. And we've also looked at three key themes that we're bringing from the Old Testament, looking for them in the new. We remembered the kind of hows and whens and whys of the Messiah that the prophets were pointing to. And we've attempted an overview of this cultural and social scene that we are heading into. Now, because we are reading the gospel stories chronologically, we're going to jump about the four gospels, as well as linking to some of those prophecies and any other relevant verses that crop up. And all of those are going to be in your reading each time. So we're starting with Matthew and we're in chapter one and the very first verse. The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Now the reason Matthew starts here is linked to how Jesus's life fulfills those all-important prophecies. For Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Judah, the promise is all nations being blessed through them. And Acts chapter 3 explains this. The covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you. And in Galatians chapter 3, Paul clarifies the seed is Christ, not Abraham's own son. But there's an interesting cross reference here to Isaiah 53, where God says of his servant, Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. So is this a mirror effect? These people are great because they are in the list leading to Jesus. And Jesus is in this particular line because some of the greats are in it. Who knows? Moving on. Next verse. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron and Hezron the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon. Pausing there, I want to consider Judah. He is the son who initiated selling Joseph. And Genesis 38 tells us that he then chooses to move away and marry into the Canaanite family, something that he should not have been doing. And this son, Perez, is actually the product of the very unfair treatment of his daughter-in-law. Why choose this wayward son of Jacob's to be part of the line? What does this message tell us? It tells us that this line of families that lead to Jesus is not a pristine, um, holy one. It's real people making real mistakes and sometimes really bad mistakes. And yet here they are in the genealogy of all genealogies. So next verse. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed was the father of Jesse. And Boaz, who I noted in my study of the book of Ruth, does some of that saviour foreshadowing, symbolising a redeemer in his attitude to the poor and the widows, they offer to drink the water, to eat the bread and the wine. His ultimate rescue of both the Jew, Naomi, and the Gentile, Ruth. Our final verse for today is verse 6. Jesse was the father of David, the king. And we were back to those fulfilling prophecies verses. 
We've got Isaiah 11, Jeremiah 23. They're examples of significant prophecies over Jesse and his son David, with 2 Samuel 7 outlining the eternal kingdom that this line is going to establish. Now, David himself is going to provide a significant amount of those messianic prophecies. They're going to be popping up in his songs and many moments like the Lord as the Son of God who will be made lower and then raised crowned and glorified. He will not rot in the grave and many, many more. The second part of verse six will be our starting point for the next session and I am going to see you then. <laughs>